Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everyone. My name is Claire, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm grateful to be sober and a proud member of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'd like to thank uh, Natasha and Grant for, they're just so lovely. They drove all the way to, to uh, L.A. to pick me up and dra- drive me down here. I had a little eye surgery, and I was advised, uh, I, I've driven around for many years down this area. I can't drive at night with the oncoming, um, just, just six, four weeks ago, the lights coming. So... They offered to come. Thank you so much. And it was very sweet. And, of course, I gave a lecture all the way down <laughs> about Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, um, uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to see, may I see the hands of, of, of the uh, newcomers, both al and, um, and, and and Alcoholics Thank you. Uh, welcome. Uh, I am, too, a double winner. I'm so impressed with, the, with this, your format. And I, you know, I'm sober by the grace of God 34 years from my first meeting. And my sponsor, uh, sent me to Al-Anon at the end of my first year. And I have never in all these years, and I get the privilege to do this a lot all over the country, most of the world. And I've never seen, I have been in a meeting where you had this far. I am really impressed. And thank all of you for being here. Uh, we tell our story in a general way, what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like to now. Um, by the time I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, I was a roaring wynette. And um, in, in, in the book, more, which is the basic text of our program, uh, it, it talks about, in, 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 cha- in Chapter 3, more about alcoholism, the insane things we sometimes continue to do to keep from doing step one, two, and three. And at the, at the end of that, re, uh, in the end of that reading, in those steps, and the, as they are listed, uh, one of them says, um, uh, we, 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 we look for, for, for natural wines. I, I had, I had switched to, uh, Ripple. And that's not one of your natural wines. As a matter of fact, I don't think a single grape's ever been near that stuff. <laughs> I don't know what they put in it, but by that time, I was literally doing a dance with death. So trouble when you're dancing with death, the music stops. And uh, I come from the jazz world, Boston, New York, and Harlem, and and uh, I know about the music, and I know about the dance, and I knew I knew at some point that I never dreamed that my life would end up the way it, it, it ended. Well, actually, I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm the youngest of seven children. My father was a full-blooded Cherokee Indian of the Cherokee Nation, I was born and raised on a reservation in North Carolina. Left that reservation, I guess, when he was about 26 years old, migrated in first into Alabama and then into Georgia. I'm not going to stay a few minutes in Georgia tonight. Um, I, um, he met my mom, had these seven children, and I was the youngest of the seven. My father was an artist and an entrepreneur and a very successful man and a very interesting man, actually. And he moved us to Atlanta so the children could have access to a, a better education. And, uh, they were born in, in, in Bainbridge, Georgia, and I was born in Atlanta. And I remember as a little child, I always felt different. I'm probably one of the ones that had the ism. I could have used a little drinky poo probably in the first grade, you know, just to get me to the second grade. Because, I mean, I had trouble, you know, you know, from a little kid, and my mom died, um, God rest her soul, when I was three months old. So I was left, you know, my dad was left with these, these kids, and, and then he later, uh, uh, a couple of years later, married a, a woman who was my stepmother. And I was probably, you know, we talk about in the book and we talk about the steps about what it was like growing up. And uh, I just remember being fearful. And I remember that she, um, which was a rather stern woman and very religious, and 
I started having trouble with God, you know, long before I ever heard of Alcoholics Anonymous or drinking or anything that would, would make a difference in our lives. And uh, my brothers and sisters all grew up, and they were all practically grown because they were so much older than I when I was. My mother had ten children, actually, three miscarriages, and she was like only 46 years old. And in those days, I mean, they had huge families, and they didn't have the medical uh, uh, processes that, that are exposed to us now. And so she died just in childbirth. And I was five years old, and in and, and, and the first grade when I heard that, that this woman was my stepmother. Um, anyway, I always felt afraid, and I was a loner, and I was, was uh, grew up in an area with my stepmother with this religious connotation of, of things that, that always frightened me. My father, I can still remember him. I'd look out this window. We had this big house, and I'd look out the window and see him out doing his Indian rituals. And I was always impressed with that, and you know, and he would never go to the church, and so I grew up in that d d divided a sense of, of 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 reality about God and and all of that. Um, I was somewhat talented, and and I, I was a terrible student, and uh, but I had some talent in art. I um, I won an art scholarship from Booker T. Washington High School in Atlanta, and I'm going to have to tell you how old I am. So you can follow me with the story. I'm 83 years old. I'll be 84 in January. And I tell you that because I start talking about things like World War II. So I think, <laughs> so I thought I better hip you to, I better hip you to, you know, my age. So, and when I talk about my age, I always say the best is yet to come. So I just go ahead and, and accept my age. I absolutely love my life. I would not have the life I have today if it wasn't for the grace of God and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I won the scholarship to, uh, to Boston Museum School of Fine Arts, which is one of the finest art schools in this country, and which was almost unusual at that time for a black person. You know, I grew up when the, when, when the, when the culture of this country was a lot different. And I know a lot of those things I had fears about, you know, I had experienced growing up there and the anger and the fear and all of the stuff. And so uh, when I won that scholarship, that's how I got out of Atlanta. I had never heard of alcohol. I grew up in the Baptist church, and I haven't have any problems with that. In the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it resolved all those, uh, those fears about it, it, when it talks about in we agnostics. But I remember one thing about that church is I always loved the music. But I really got a little tired of that minister and those preachers and the um, deacons praying over me as sinner. And I'm seven and eight and nine years old, and I don't know what it is I've done that's so bad that they keep tell, reminding me of it. <laughs> so, I mean, I had a problem with the church and my stepmother and God, and, and I, I was never allowed to do it. I never had friends. And when I, it, that's when fingernail polish and lipstick started. That's why I tell you how old I am started coming out in stores, and and I uh, was not allowed to do any of that. So I was always out in the woods painting or drawing, and I was a loner. And when I got that scholarship, I remember sitting on a segregated train out of Atlanta, and I, man, this, I was waving my finger. And I'm telling you, I, you know, and I'm 19 years old. Had never, I was never allowed to go to movies. I couldn't wear makeup. I was told how terrible boys were, stay away from them, and all this these stuff that, you know, we learned about in the steps set up all that fear. And I'm sitting there, you know, I had, the, this is the ism. I'm saying I had no friends. I'm 19 years old, could never, I, 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 I was out of space. Uh, I never heard of alcohol, because in South in those days, uh, below the, they called the Mason-Dixon line, alcohol was forbidden in this country. So it was never legal. I got sober to learn that they had that they had those they made it out in the woods. Or they call it I don't know, white light. No, it's something I know now. But it, then I didn't know it existed on the earth. But I am. I, I remember sitting on that train and saying, "I'll fix them." And they didn't even know I was leaving town. You know. You know. I was just, you know. And that was they talk about resentment to be talking about in the steps. But I remember arriving in in uh, in, the, in Boston. And walking into that school, 
and it was incredible time. Though it was war, it was the 1940, and the streets were we were at war with you know with Japan and Germany, and the streets were filled with servicemen. I, there was rarely, unless they were out of age, over the age for to be in the service. It was all sailors, and it was exciting, and it was its time, and the jazz world, and it was, I mean, I was so excited. And I looked around, and I went into that school, and I'm one of those uh, that, you know, a couple of weeks of something, I'm interested in, and then if it's not exciting enough, I have to start looking for something else. I don't know if you're like that, but, you know, I had never been to a movie, so I said to I started going to the movies. I was amazed. I look up on that screen. The rooms were dark, and uh, and I look up there, and uh, there's Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers dancing. I'd never seen anybody dance because I never heard the music, except I always heard the church music, and you know I didn't know anything about any other type of music. They um, and I was started hanging out there all the time. One night I decided to go ask a friend. We were walking down the street in Boston. And I heard this jazz music, which I absolutely had started listening to. And these people walked out, and I said to her, Eleanor, why don't we just go in there and see what they're doing? We walk in there, and I shall never forget, it was dimly lit, and the, the aroma of the cigarettes and the booze, and down at the end of the bar was this little band and a rather portly lady, and she was singing the blues. And I remember my heart just started pounding. I looked down there, and I looked at her, and we go, and we sit on the stool. And I leaned, and the bartender leaned over, and he said, what are you going to have to drink? I had no idea. But I remembered in the movies, they always talked about martinis. And I was about to commit my first hip slick cool act. Because I leaned on that bar, and I looked at him dead in the eye, and I, and I said, yeah, we'll have a martini, honey. I said, and make it dry. I had no idea what a dry martini was. <laughs> but they always said that in the movies. And I saw, and he, he turned around with these two stem glasses, and he, he had a, uh, and I know, you know it was a blender, but he tied this can, and he leaded it up, and it looked like lemonade. I, I didn't, you know, in the South, it's all, we always was, I was used to seeing lemonade. I didn't know you sip drinks. So I look up and down the bar, which became a big habit later. You know, I'm up and down, and I picked it up, and I opened my mouth, and I dumped it. I was a pig from the gate. But I remember the way it made me feel. Man, I used to sulk. People used to punch me to try to make me smile growing up. I got a permanent smile on my face, and I walk out there as a little dance floor, and these couples were dancing, and I'd heard those messages from that stepmother about staying away from boys and stuff. Man, those fantasies came racing in there, and I, I got this smile, and I'm waving this empty glass in my hand, just moving it around. And that night, I got myself some new friends. I never had any old ones, but I got some new ones here, and uh, uh, they, and the, I called them colorful, but the big book calls them lower companions. I hooked up with the pimps, the madams, and the and the bad boys. And I learned to walk the walk and to talk the talk. And I never dreamed that 25 years later I would end up in, in, in South Central Los Angeles in the, ghetto, in the ghetto dying of alcoholism. But that first drink, I don't want to forever forget the first drink, and I don't want to forever forget the last drink. I've heard from the old timers around these meetings for all these years, if you forget your last drink, you know you're going to do it again. I don't want to ever forget how I how I ended up down there, but I mean now I am hanging out, man. I'm still in school, but I'm in those jazz clubs night after night, and it was it was wonderful. And you could walk into a club, and who's standing on that stage but the late great legend Billy Holiday? And there was Duke Ellington, and there was Louis Armstrong, and I started hanging out with that lifestyle that lasted for ten years. And I still did all the other things, but I'm one of the ones on page 21 of the big book of alcoholics that talks about the real alcoholic. And I'm one of the ones who drank for a lot of years, didn't have blackout, you know, I just, and I, I, I just, I, it was a heavy drinker, but it did never really, really, really bother me really. Uh, and when I was about 16, 18 years old, it started, it started to change. 
as the book tells us, you know, I, I, I talk, cross that invi invisible line. Uh, I got met a nice young man from the Boston family. We got married. Uh, we had a little son. And now I'm in the fast lane. And I am in those clubs. And, uh, and I became friendly. Used to hang out with Billy. We, you know, we'd go out to after hour joints. It was, it was wonderful and it was exciting. Uh, but something about kids, they grow up. They started looking at you with that look. In the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it describes the kind of uh, alcoholic I was becoming at that time when it says, selfishness and self-centeredness that we think is the root of our troubles. And it goes on in that paragraph to say we're driven people, and we're driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. And that nailed me because now the grandparents are, are raising him and I, I go over there and I take that look at him and he's looking at me with that look and, and saying those things like, but mom, you promised me the last time you were here that you were going to take me to the park. You promised me, you promised me this and you promised me that. And I pat him on the head and I say, yeah, baby, but next time. You see, cause I had more important things to do sitting on the bar stools in, 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 in Boston. And then we'd go over to New York and ha hanging out in Harlem. And when I get back, I take them a lot of gifts, and you know, I send them to a better camp and then better schools and all that stuff. But I want to tell you something: I never could buy the love. So I know about street life. You see, you can buy love in the streets. And my, I still love jazz music. I listen to it every day. Uh, but there's one of the songs that's still out that I can relate to, and it is called Street, street, street Life. And, and the lyrics are paraphrasing when they say, you know, uh, if you are young, don't get old in the streets. Because the cold's going to hit you in the back and you're going to nickel and dime your life away. And you look back one day, it was all a masquerade. Because there's a thousand lives to play out there until you play your life away. And that's where I was. I was just playing my life away, looking for more, greedy. You know, it was never, one drink was never enough, and a, a thousand never would have been enough. So I'm sitting on the bar stool one night, and uh, my husband's family owned uh, a, a trucking company, and he traveled a lot. But my, that relationship was, I was in that marriage 25 years. We drank drink for drink, and that's why I like about the al -Anon, because we drank drink for drink. So I had no comparison, but um, when he was out, I still hung out with the same people. And, um, I, you know, the thing about the, the progression of the disease, I'm now looking at other people, and I'm hanging, because it's not enough. I'm not getting enough out of this, and uh, what's in it for me? You know, the part about the selfishness and the self-centeredness, and uh, I thought, well, it would be with a, another relationship. And so I, I prayed about this man, you know, I... I, I described him. I'll describe him when I met him. When he, I'm sitting there talking to Billy Holiday. This is true. And this man walked up, and it was in this jazz club, and the smoke, the cigarettes, and and he had I'm a, he had a black hat turned down all the way around. He had on a light blue top coat, and this dude was so cool he couldn't get his arms through the sleeves, and he just put his lean on that bar. And he peeled out of ten one hundred dollar bills and he spread it on the bar like this and he took his hand and, and he leaned over and he said, Spend it. I knew God had answered my prayer. I wasn't much of a prayer. I was not much of a prayer because I didn't believe in God. I looked at that hundred dollars that was a lot of money in those days. And he turned out to be the head of the mafia of the Boston family. Then I know what it's like to become uh, associated with the head of the boss. I mean, the real man. I know what it's like to ride in limousines with bodyguards. And it was a lifestyle, and that's all it was. I know the difference today between a lifestyle and a life. And that's what it, that the madness really started and the progression. And um, now we are going over, and when my husband came home, I introduced him to him. We all hung out together. I mean, that's just, just the way it was. And we are now, you know, my son is 10 years old. And um, and there's, there's something is about to change here. And we were going over to New York to um, to, to this jazz club. It's, a, it's even in history today. It's a, it's a famous club called Birdland. And a lot of you are young, and I'm not dropping names. It's just my story. And uh, uh, Billy Eckstein was the opening star that night. And so I remember we get in the limousine, and 
And I called this man Mr. Wonderful. I never called him anything else, just Mr. Wonderful. We had these bodyguards. They sat in, and they, it, was, it was one of those, if you guys like classic cars, it would be classic now. It was a Mercedes that had the white wild wall tires, and it had the trunk on the back, and, and it had a, and it had the seat you pull down where the bodyguard sat, and then they had the driver, and then they had me and him, and if the husband was there, he came to us, we all sat in the back, so we went over to New York. And uh, <clears throat> driving back, if anybody was going to kill us, you know, in those days, the mob was really, I mean, it was like the goddess. I mean, it was like the godfather. It was really like that. Because I remember if they wanted to go to the restroom, he'd send everybody to check the restroom before we could go to the restroom, before, you know, anyway. So we are on the way back, and something happened. It was the beginning of what I call an Alcoholics Anonymous, those moments of clarity. That you get over a period of years when you're, you're destined to go to the very bottom, you know, fighting this disease and wanting to, just, wanted to keep what you got and afraid that uh, you're going to lose what you get, what you already have. And we're sitting in the back of that limousine, and um, he was asleep, the, the bodyguards were asleep, and it was on a Sunday morning. And I've come to believe that God has always tried to get my, my attention on Sunday mornings. And I look out the window, and it was, a, it, it was a beautiful day, and these young families were about to cross the street into this beautiful New England church. And it was like a voice said to me, Clara, something is wrong with your life. And I agreed. It's Boston. <laughs> get out of town. Let's get out of town. And uh, I said to my husband, I said, you know, I said, I think, you know, why don't we move to California? He had relatives here. And his, his aunt and uncle were famous dancers at MGM. And so I said, why don't we get out, uh, why don't we move to California? And he agreed it was a good idea. So typical alcoholic me, I, I just closed up the house, left the furniture and everything in it. And I go pick up the kid, and he's 10 years old, and he looks at me, and I said, we're going to move to California to see your, uh, your aunts and uncles. And he thought it was a good idea. And I'm, I'll never forget that drive. Right out Rooster 66, right in L.A. And I mean, it was a wild drive. And I went with good intentions. See, but I'm an alcoholic. Because uh, I was going to try to be a, a good mother to this little boy. I was going to try to live differently and be a lady. My Indian father used to say, all I want from my daughters is to be certain ladies. And, um, and they gave us everything that's supposed to fit you, make you be somebody, but I, I missed that one. So I ended up um, I, hopping on the first bar stool right across the street from where the, you guys picked me up uh, today. That in those days was called the Ruby Art Room, and um, and I climbed up in the stool, and I was off and running. Uh, by a fluke, I went into a little small business, and uh, and I got said we got settled, and uh, we had two more children, and uh, now it's beginning to cross the line. I'm way on the other side of the line, because now I'm beginning. Uh, Ten years into that company, I had become very successful. At what I, I did by fluke, I never got to teach the art. Um, the husband had a great job. My brothers and sisters moved from the East Coast, Boston and, and New York, and started their careers. And one of my sisters was a nurse, and she was a nurse at Caesar Sinai Hospital in Beverly Hills. And I was beginning to lose it all, thank you, God, that you took away from me everything I wanted in order to give me what I needed. Because it came that time in my life when I needed to stop drinking and I needed to stop dying and I needed to find a God of my understanding. Now, the older son was 10 years older than the next son. And um, they began to lose it all. The, uh, the uh, banks repossessed all the vans. I had 20 employees and all this was going. And I can't stop drinking. And I'm in violent blackouts. I never had blackouts all those years, and it started. I'm ending up in County General Hospital downtown LA, um, being treated by uh, USC in, in, in medical interns. 
you know, and those are the days the way they treated you because now they, they, they take the, like, the, again, when you get cut or it brew, I mean, when your skin is open, they stitch you up. And I got really nervous when I could see these little strings hanging off and they're sticking up the scars in my face where I'm getting beaten up. And, uh, I remember my husband came to me and he said, you know, this is too much. He said, I, I can't live like this. Either you're going to kill me or I'm going to kill you. And I don't want our kids to see this anymore. And we've been married at that time 25 years. And strangely enough, when I got sober, he drank all those years, and he never really turned into an alcoholic. The minute he walked away from me, he just stopped drinking. I, I never, never have understood that. Um, he, uh, so anyway, we, um, uh, I, I watched the, um, the banks take everything. I came in here owing twenty thousand dollars. Pay. I mean, it was madness. Uh, I went to the hospital one day when they were going to take the house back. And uh, the marshal with the, this green uniform on, and my son, the next son was then like 14. The, my daughter was maybe 10 and a half. And I went to her and I said, you know, we just need two payments um, to save the house. And she looked at, us, at me and she said, it pains us to watch you live the way you live. And I looked at that sister, that we were a close, loving family. And I could see her pain. She said, but you know, we're not going to sign any more checks. We're not going to bail you out of any more trouble. Because if you don't stop drinking, you're going to die. And man, with that, I, from my little girl and that stepmother telling me if I died, I was going to hell and told me about the devil and what he was going to do with that pitchfork. When she said that, for some reason, the fear of death was haunting me right in the AA. I've dealt with it now through the steps. I, I darted out of there, and I went back and I stood in front of the house. I had the two kids. The, he, my son was 19. He had kind of left. He'd gone into um, his, uh, you know, training in theater and uh, the, with his relatives and training him for dancing and stuff. And he had kind of left the house. But I'm sitting there on those steps with those two kids, and and uh, one friend I have an Israeli friend. She still lives in Woodland Hills. Had put some money. In, in an envelope and just sealed it and uh, and left it and I just didn't pay much attention to it and uh, when the marshal uh, put the lock on and he locked it away he just looked at me and moved away and I'm sitting there and I had one little bag to, with clothes in it for the two kids the, the two younger ones the son walked down the street and he saw me sitting on the steps because I had no place to go I, I lost, I'm sitting, I had no place to go. My family had said, we love you, but goodbye. We just cannot, they didn't know anything about Al-Anon, but that's the best thing in the world they could have done for me. Um, my son walked up to me and he said, I don't know where you're going. He said, but you know, you've never been there for us. And I don't, I, I'm not going wherever you're going because I don't want to watch you die. And that son walked away and my arrogance is a, as an alcoholic, I mean, I'm just, and my arrogance said, and screw you too. I dealt with that in my, in, in, in my immense step with him. Um, I opened that envelope, and there was some money in there, and uh, an address, and it was over in South Central, off of, off of Slauson and Crenshaw, if any of you didn't know about that area. And I walk up there, and uh, he, she'd made these arrangements. For me, and and paid this money for the rent for the first month's rent. I walk up those steps. I open that door, and I drew the drapes, and I think I was doomed to die this disease. And those kids looked around; they'd never seen any uh, uh, else live that way. And I got dressed for the journey. I bought myself a. A terracloth, white terracloth robe and a bright red wig. I don't know why I bought the wig. You know, I thought maybe, you know, I just, so nobody would recognize me down there. I'd never been down there before. I'm used to hanging out with stars. Um, and, um, and I used to get drunk. The, the, the wig had bangs. And I used to get drunk off that ripple wine and trim the bangs. And I, and I mean, they would be zigzag, 
And, you know, it got so bad that uh, the grandparents took the kids and uh, moved them down to Santa Monica. And now I, the drapes are really drawn because I'm, I'm, but now I was down there for three years. And I would come to out of those blackouts, sitting in front of the television in those days, it was still black and white, and watching it turn over. And my heart, you know, would just be pounded from fear. And I, I had to get out of there and, you know, and hear, or go hear the music. And I'd get into all those sleazy bars down there around over 104th Street in that area where, I mean, it is ter- it's bad now. It was terrible then. Um, and I loved, I don't know if you were bar, bar, uh, bar drinkers. I loved sitting, going to those, those sleazy bars, sitting on that stool, that end stool. That was my favorite stool. And looking in that mirror. You know, probably feeling like Eleanor Rigby, wondering where all those other lonely people were coming from. And you know, we drank, you know, we, you know, wine was 49 cents a, a glass and, uh, we drank out of the barrel. It didn't have any labels on it. We don't know what we drank. It just came out of that barrel and they, the bartender would just, it no risk ask, just wine, beer and wine. And you know, every once in a while, you know, I would meet some uh, guys on that, you know, loneliness is part of our disease. And I knew if I could just find somebody to talk to, instead of coming to our, in, in a fee position on a dirty floor. And, and once in a while, you know, I'll tell you, tell you about one that was very interesting. He was a very nice looking guy, kind of looked like Danzel Washington type. Now, I, by now, I got wine sores on my face and, and my body. I'm 65 pounds overweight. I'm living off food stamps and welfare and hustling whatever little change I could get wherever the way I, I could do it. You know, the, uh, you know, alcoholism is a disease and it has no gender. But as an alcoholic woman, I tell you, I want to tell you the price. The book calls it pitiful and comprehensible demoralization. And I remember those moments. And I remember, you know, not a, a identif- being able to identify the face. And uh, I'm sitting there, and this guy turned to me, and he said, <clears throat> uh, he introduced himself. He told me he was a retired lieutenant colonel in the United States Air Force. I was really impressed because he was about 24 years old. And I said, really? He said, yeah, honey. Um he said, I fly secret missions. He's drinking 49 cent wine, too. <laughs> he said, I fly secret missions all over the world. And I was impressed because in those days, the United States used to have what they call U-2 planes that circle the world. They don't have it now, but to, to see what the other part of the world was doing. And I said, Wow. And he took it, he said, can I have a sip of your wine? I said, yeah. He took a sip of my wine, and then he, he looked at me, and he said, yeah, last night I flew over Russia. I took a sip of my wine, and I looked at him, and I said, I know you did, darling, because I was with you on that trip. So, you know, um, that's the kind of drinking we were doing. <laughs> and those are the kind of men, I, the relationships I was meeting off the bar. But what would happen at that awful hour of the morning? I come to our black house in front of that house at, at three and four o'clock in the morning in, in a field position in tall wet grass. In those days, the dogs pe- travel in packs in that area. It was all about survival. Uh, and they had metal trash cans in those days. And it would take several of those dogs to push the can into the street where well, they look for garbage and some food. I could still hear the lid rolling down the street. I'm in the grass talking to a God I don't believe in and saying, if you just get me off the ground, get up off that ground and get up those stairs and get down that that filthy house where I lived and the conditions to the bathroom that was dirty and on my knees, my chin rolling around on that cold porcelain and I'd go into a blackout. It would seem to me that times I would throw up my very soul when I don't, I wasn't eating in those days. I was just drinking. I'd come to a uh, blackout with my head leaning against the t- cold porcelain. And the two words that always greeted me was American Standard. I just then stare at it, you know. And, and then I'd get up. And then, and then that's the way it just, just kept going. 
Finally, one morning, um, one more time on a Sunday morning in Inglewood, I don't know how I got up, still trying to be a party girl, still hanging on those bars. Um, I, it, we didn't have cell phones in those days. We had uh, uh, pay stations out on, in, on the, uh, around the city. And one more time, I come to out of the blackout. I remember a leg with a cowboy boot. I never saw the face. And these boots had cleats on the end. My head was against where the forum is now. wasn't that. It was right where in that area at Crenshaw and Prairie View Avenue in that area. This dude was kicking me in the head. I know about pain, and that pain has no memory. In the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it describes the second step of insanity because it describes the jaywalker who kept doing the same things over and over again and always expected a different result. I kept doing those things. He was kicking me in the head, and I was going in and out of consciousness, not because of, I was drunk, because medically they say, you know, the, the body can only ha handle so much pain, and the unconsciousness is because you can't feel any more pain. When I came to again, I was in Daniel Freeman Hospital in Englewood. I don't know if any of you know where that is. Nuns leaning over me, police, uh, um, the paramedics. They didn't have paramedics like they have now, but they had some guys in a black, you know, I don't know what it was. It looked like a hearse, but I, I think it was, well, I don't know how they got me there. And there was an older nun, and she uh, was uh, had on horn rim glasses, and she was leaning over me. And she had her hands in the sleeves. And the paramedics had hooked me up to uh, some kind of equipment that was pumping my, pumping my, kept me alive. I, I kept jumping like that until I was, I was alive. The police kept saying, and the, and the nun said to the police, y you tell them, you tell them who did this. I'm in the black, I still don't know. I'm 34 years old, I have no idea who it was. But I learned from the mafia, you know, you don't tell them anything. I said to this nun, buzz off. And she turned and she walked away. She stood in the door for a few moments. And she, she must have been in her 60s. She had her hands in her sleeves. And she just looked back at me and just shook her head. And something happened, that moment of clarity. Because people had all been telling me to stop drinking and what to do. The paramedics left. The police left. But the young nun stood there in her early 20s. I call her my earth angel. She was, uh, she had on this white habit, and all I could see, she was wiping the blood out of the corner, I had a brain concussion. She was wiping the blood out of the corner of my eyes, and he kicked in all my ribs. And she was wiping the blood away, and she started to cry. She looked down at me, and she said, how did you ever let your life get into such a state? I looked up at this young nun, and I shook my head because I never thought alcohol was what the reason I was there. It was people, places, and things. If they get off my back and stop, that was my problem. Um, three days later, she dressed me, and uh, you should have seen her trying to put the wig on. You know, they they always they, all of them, even the Catholic hospital, seventy two hours for alcoholics. And you should have seen her trying to figure out where the bangs went on that wig. She was, you know, she was moving it around. And and I was, by this time, I had, my joints were so swollen, my ankles, I, I, um, I, I couldn't wear shoes. So I was, I had on my favorite uh, gold fuzzy house slippers. And uh, she put her arms around me and she said, try not to drink today. And ladies and gentlemen, I am an alcoholic. I shuffled away, bandaged up, uh, because I couldn't stand up to hold the ribs and a brain concussion. Uh, I went to the nearest liquor store. That's the insanity of the disease. And I bought some wine. And three weeks later, I don't know what happened that morning that was different from any, a lot of the other mornings. But I, um, came to, uh, it was um, uh, uh, April the 9th, 1974, on an early morning, and I was on the floor, and the stench of this wine in an unkept body, and I hope I never forget that moment, 
because uh, when I came off that floor, I just stood up and started to cry. And I said, God, just don't let me die. I'm going to die. And that was my moment of truth. I was telling you about Georgia and, and the music, and I loved it. And it was, was always a requirement when you got to be a teenager was to sing in the choir. And I can remember those songs, and they were all so, uh, uh, spirituals in the old song books. And they were yellow because in those days, uh, most of the spirituals, were never, they never had anyone who wrote the lyrics. But the slaves in the fields of Georgia, used to sing those songs, and that's how they were written. And I remember one of the songs, was about 15 years old, that used to always touch me. And the, and the lyrics went something like, um, Soon one morning, death came knocking on my door. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do? And that was, I believe, was my a spiritual awakening, because... Um, the power of God that I have come to believe in must have kissed me gently and said, you don't have to live like an animal again. I called that same friend, Rachel. I went to the phone, and I called this number. She said, it's called Alcoholics Anonymous. Call them. They'll help you. They help each other stay sober. I went to the phone, and I called this man, and, 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 and uh, the, this gentleman answered. He said, good morning. My name is, Al- my name is Jim. He said, and I'm an alcoholic. How can I help you? And I said, man, in my best street language, I said, I, I, I think I'm going to die if I don't stop drinking. He said, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. He told me where to go to meetings and uh, that night. And I got dressed that day for my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I could pull out a red dress, and it, was, it had wine stains on it, and I cleaned up the wig. And he asked me one simple question that I asked newcomers today. Do you think you can just not drink today? Nobody ever asked me that. And he said, well, you promised me you'll just try it. And I said, I'll try that. And so I went off to, you know, I wanted to look good because I didn't know who you guys were, and I just wanted to, so I went over to Woolworths. During that last ride over in, in, in that area, they burnt that one down. But it was there when I went up. And so I, I just I put I, I had a leather jacket. And I was just browsing, trying to get, it was an 8 o'clock meeting, but I, I was wanted to be dressed by 7, just to keep from going to the liquor store. I stayed in that in, the, in, the, in there for about a, uh, about an hour, going just to come kind of the counter, looking, just looking. So I stole some eyelashes for my first meeting of alcohol. So I looked good. They come long. I didn't know you were supposed to trim them down the size. And, you know, it, at 7 o'clock, I, I put them under my jacket. I beat it back to that house. And at 7 o'clock, I'm standing in front of the mirror, and, I, and now I'm, I'm detoxing. I don't know what that means, but I'm shaking like a leaf. I'm perspiring. And I didn't know what was happening to my body. And I grabbed these. I, I had on my wig. I was looking good, you know. I really. And I borrowed my brother's car. He worked at Delta Airlines. And the, you know, they come with a little tube of glue. And I was shaking so badly. I, I remember squeezing it along the edge and grabbing my elbow and waiting for an opportune moment. <laughs> I slammed it in, and one end was up here and the other end was down there. I was too tired to start all over. I leaned in the mirror. I said, you are looking good. And uh, I went off to my first meeting, and it's been the journey ever since. And I went to that meeting that night. I met my sponsor, who's still my sponsor today at that night. The meetings were small, and I was taught right from the beginning to get into the books and to be of service, and that's what has been my journey for. I haven't been out there since that meeting, I mean, uh, since that day of, uh, of April the 9th, 1974. Uh, I got into those steps, and uh, if you knew, that's, that's how it all begins, and that's how we stay here. Uh, I started to, my, my on the men's list, my first uh, names were my, my kids. My older son had become very famous as a performer in Broadway shows, and uh, he was uh, in New York at the time, and he was with with the uh, ABC television, and he was uh, the anchor for people like Barbara Walters, and he was doing well. It took him four years to come back to see me, but I made my amends to the next, uh, the others. I remember how difficult the fourth column of the of the inventory step. There's four columns there. The first the column was, was, was a column for me to take responsibility for my action and behavior 
it, during those years of my alcoholism and then with the family and other people. Um, so I uh, I made amends to my two younger ones, and I remember putting them in the room, sitting them down in the room, and telling them how, how sorry I was that I was a sick person. That was not an excuse, but I was a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I didn't have to live like that anymore. And you know, kids, I mean, that age, you know, they accepted it, you know. So anyway, uh, we got on with our lives, and the promises started to come true. I um, saw my daughter go into the ice capades. It's, uh, uh, the grandparents is one as the first black one of the first black professional ice skaters uh, with the Dorothy Hamill tour, and and I was buried in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. I still am because this is my life and this is what I love. When I was three years sober, I went back into that company I've lost, and I have this company now for twenty four years, uh, twenty eight years. Um, uh, that older son. Um, we became friends. He came back to L.A. to do some shows, and we became very good friends. And this is in the late 80s, and he was at that time, as I told you, what he was doing. But I don't know if any of you ever heard of Studio 54. Well, he got involved with the celebrities of Studio 50. That's when drugs first were coming on the streets. Now, I hung in those clubs with all the famous people, Dinah Washington, all, uh, 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 Lena Horne, all of them. And in those days, drugs were always out there, but they were always in the private clubs, uh, those jazz clubs, because the mafia owned all of those clubs. So we used to close the door, and I used to see it all, but I never touched the hard drugs. My hard drug was alcohol. So um, he got involved in that in that group of so well, I, He had three more years of contract there. And he called me one night, and he said, Mom, you know, I'm getting really worried. I, I'm getting really worried about what I'm doing, but I didn't know what he was doing, and so when his contract was over, he came back to L.A., got married, and had a, a, a son, a, my, my little grandson is about, he's 20, 20 years old now, but the marriage didn't last, and he moved to San Francisco uh, to teach his uh, theater arts at that level, and in 1989, he called me, Mom, he said, I went to the doctor, I don't feel well. And they tell me I've got something called HIV. And in those days, that was a di- that was it. No medication, nothing. And by this by this time, he um, he said, "But I'll keep working until I I can't work," because he had been shooting cocaine and sharing the needle in Studio 54. And uh, he called me 19 months later, Mom. I I, I can't work because I'm gonna die. And I want to come home to die. Here's a little boy I couldn't take to the park. But because of the grace of God and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and trying to live by its principles, you see, I had a place for him. Thank you, God. And he came home, and my daughter is happily married and, and, and doing well, and we all gathered around him. You knew you never have to do anything alone again. Because members of Alcoholics Anonymous are always there. A lot of uh, old timers like Bob, you guys know Bob. You know, Bob is here. He was one of my mentors. That's, you know, uh, and they were all there for us. And, and I uh, had, I put, had a private place for him. And, and it, you know, we were all, and he'd done some work, and maybe you newcomers know um, something about the Grateful Dead. And he'd done some work for them, some lyrics. They heard he was dying of AIDS. And he went from a handsome young man to a hundred pounds. And I sat, I gave my business, they ran it, and I sat for days. We talked about a lot of things. And that's why we have those steps in the eighth and ninth step. You know, when that moment comes that we don't have to, you know, try to make it all up. We've lived the living amends. That's what Al-Anon and AA is about. And um, it was ten Ten about ten thirty on a Saturday morning, and while all my sponsees and my family and members of Alcoholics Anonymous were around that bed, and the rape, Grateful Dead had written some lyrics for him, and he had asked us to sing it because he could no longer talk. Their mouth gets white inside, and I used to take the straw and dip water onto their lips, and, and um, the danger we were all in because we didn't know anything about the, the virus. Well, we sang that song. And that rasping sound of death, and he was gone. 
And I pray that his soul rode the wings of angels to a higher place. No more crying and no more dying. And I, I, I get the opportunity to come and share my experience, strength, and hope with you. That the program of Alcoholics Anonymous works if we do the work. And it gives us a, I have the freedom I never had in my life. And when I tell you I'm 83 years old, these have been the best years of my life through God's grace in you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.